Can I also take the opportunity to thank Dominic Greaves, the chair of that committee, for his work, and also the former members that also served on the committee. Could I also thank the agencies and civil servants for their, impact, their, their input into this uh, report, and also thank the open source commentators and academics that also contributed to the report. Under the Justice and Security Act, uh, the committee must send its report to the Prime Minister for confirmation that they can be published. Uh, as has been widely reported, the Prime Minister failed to provide his confirmation that this report could be published within the standard 10, 10, day, 10 working days. And as a result, the House rose for the general election uh, before the report could be published. There was no reason for this delay. Number 10 uh, have said that there are only six days in which to uh, look at this report. That is not true. The Prime Minister confer com has also said, the uh, office has also said, uh, that it usually takes six weeks to actually uh, to get this confirmation. Can I also say that's categorically not true? The number 10 has also reported that it also had to go back around government for uh, comment again. This is not true. It had already been uh, through the processes. The final point is said that the proper processes hadn't been followed in the uh, consideration of this report. Can I also say that category is not true. Everyone who needed to see the report in government had done so. It was now waiting for the Prime Minister to uh, agree uh, the report. Uh, which was sent to him on the 17th of uh, October. The Prime Minister finally uh, provided confirmation the day after the election, uh, having say, taken a record time in doing so. However, the report can only be laid uh, by the committee, uh, so we had to wait seven months for the committee to be constituted, again, a record period of time. The committee met last week, uh, to agree unanimously uh, the report would be published before the House rose for the summer recess. And I'm pleased the report has therefore finally been published today, nine months after it was uh, completed. There has been some attempt to discredit the report by suggesting that the nine-month delay means that the report is now stale and out of date. You'll see uh, very clearly uh, yourselves today, this is not the case. The delay by the Prime Minister inevitably fueled a great deal of speculation as to why and what the report might say, in particular around the EU referendum. That is why uh, Stuart and I thought it was important to talk about the report to tell you the key findings uh, and to address the speculation that has taken place over the last nine months. Can I now hand over to Stuart? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me start by saying that the UK is one of Russia's top Western intelligence targets. Uh, we know that Russia targets the UK, uh, and not just to steal secrets or research. Uh, it suits uh, Russia if there is disunity in the West. It weaponizes information. Uh, Russia's intelligence services are disproportionately large and powerful, and they can act with little constraint. And the fusion between state, business, and serious and organized crime in Russia gives them further weight and leverage. Russia poses an all-encompassing security threat, which is fueled by paranoia about the West and a desire to be seen as a resurgent great power. It carries out malicious cyber activity in order to assert itself aggressively, for example, by attempting to interfere in other countries' elections and by pre-positioning itself on other countries' critical national infrastructure, and this is an immediate threat to national security. Which is why we were concerned during our inquiry to find out there is no clear coordination of the numerous organizations across the UK intelligence community who are working on this issue, and that there is a bizarrely complicated wiring diagram of responsibilities amongst ministers for no good reason. We need a simpler chain of command. We've seen that the government is now taking an assertive approach when it comes to identifying and, bla and laying blame on the perpetrators of cyber attacks 
and we do welcome this. And the UK should encourage other countries to adopt a similar approach to naming and shaming. And we should also be working with our allies to develop an international doctrine on the use of offensive cyber. Kevin. Russia promotes uh, disinformation and attempts to uh, influence overseas, uh, whether that's through social media, hack and leak, or using its state-owned traditional media uh, has been widely reported. The UK is clearly a target and must equip itself uh, to counter such effort. Our paper-based voting and counting system uh, makes actual interference with the mechanism uh, difficult. The focus uh, instead is on attempts to influence voters before they cast their votes by spreading disinformation and creating discord by amplifying existing differences. So the question is, is who is protecting the British public from uh, interference in our democratic process? Well, in a nutshell, uh, we found no one is. Uh, we found the defence uh, of the UK's democratic process uh, is a hot potato. No one was prepared to accept their overall lead. Uh, now can we, 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 we now do understand that there is a considerable nervousness about the security intelligence agencies getting involved in the mechanics of a democratic process, and that's rightly so. But we're also talking about here about the protection uh, of uh, the process. DCMS and the Electoral Commission simply do not have the weight and access required uh, to tackle a major hostile state threat. Uh, dem democracy is integral to our uh, country's success and well-being. Protecting it must be a ministerial priority. With the Office of Security and Counterterrorism in, in, in counter taking the policy lead and the operational role sitting with MI5. This needs to be gripped now. The government must also ensure that social media uh, companies who have failed to play their part to take down uh, the use of uh, their platforms by hostile states. We need clear deadlines uh, within which material will be removed and government need to name and shame uh, those who fail to do so. Can I now hand over back to Stuart? This uh, lack of interest in responsibility is important because it translates directly across in terms of investigation into an action against interference. And we saw that when we looked into allegations that Russia sought to influence voters in the 2016 referendum on the UK's membership of the European Union. Studies have pointed to the preponderance of pro-Brexit or anti-EU stories on RT and Sputnik and the use of bots and trolls. The actual impact of such attempts on the result itself, by which I mean did the disinformation actually change how people voted, would be difficult, if not impossible, to prove. There has, however, been speculation that this report was going to reveal either that Russia had interfered in or sought to influence the referendum. In the committee's view, it's worse than that. The report reveals that no one in government knew if Russia interfered in or sought to influence the referendum because they did not want to know. The UK government have actively avoided looking for evidence that Russia interfered. We were told that they hadn't seen any evidence, but that is meaningless if they hadn't looked for it. The committee found it astonishing that no one in government had sought beforehand to protect the referendum from such attempts or investigated afterwards what attempts to influence it there may have been. The government, the UK government, should have recognised the threat back in 2014 in relation to the Scottish referendum, but it didn't. It didn't understand the threat until after the hack and leak operation against the Democratic National Committee in the United States. And because it was too slow to recognise the threat, it didn't take action to protect the UK in 2016. One would have thought that once the existence of that threat had been understood, seeing what had happened in the US, that someone here would have wanted to understand the extent and nature of the threat to the UK, 
and we wanted to see the post-referendum assessment. But there isn't one. There has been no assessment of Russian interference in the EU referendum. And this goes back to nobody wanting to touch this issue with a 10-foot pole. This is in stark contrast to the US response to reports of interference in the 2016 presidential elections. No matter how politically awkward or potentially embarrassing, there should have been an assessment of Russian interference in the EU referendum, and there must now be one. And the public must be told the results of that assessment. <coughs> we heard last week the government disclosed details of attempts to influence the 2019 election. And there was considerable suspicion about the timing of that announcement and whether it was designed to draw the sting from this report. I cannot see anything that would draw the sting from this report. Uh, I will say that it's good that work now appears to be done to investigate attempts to interfere in the UK's democratic process, uh, although the committee, the new committee, will reserve judgment as it has yet to receive the underlying intelligence. But it is all rather too late. They should have done this in respect of previous democratic processes. Uh, we must not let what has happened recently deflect attention from the retrospective work which does need to be done to investigate previous attempts. Now, coming back to Kevin Jones' comments about the delay in publication and speculation, speculation as to why that was, the previous chair said he thought that the British public should have been able to see the report before the election. And I agree. The public was allowed to go into that election without knowing that the government had not sought to investigate whether hostile states had been interfering in UK democratic processes. And I find that shocking. Kevin. Thank you, Stuart. The outrage isn't that there was interference. Uh, the outrage is that no one has wanted to know if there was interference. And that, I think, comes through very loud and clear in our report. What we do know uh, about uh, Russian influence in the UK is that it's the new normal. Successive governments have welcomed Russian oligarchs and their money with open arms. Uh, and there is a lot of Russians uh, with very close links to uh, Putin who are now very well integrated into both UK business, political and social scene in what has been referred to as, Lenin, uh, as it London grad. Yet few, if any, questions have been asked regarding the provenance of considerable wealth. This open door uh, approach has provided an ideal mechanism by which illicit finance could be recycled through the London laundromat. And it is not just the oligarchs either. Uh, the arrival of Russian money has resulted in a growth industry of enablers, uh, lawyers, accountants, estate agents, have all played a role, wittingly or unwittingly, uh, and formed a buffer of Westerners who are de facto agents of the Russian state. There is an obvious inherent tension between the government's prosperity agenda and the need to protect national security. To a certain extent, this cannot be untangled. The pr priority now uh, must be to mitigate the risk and ensure that where hostile state uh, hostile activity is uncovered, that proper tools exist to tackle it uh, at its source and to challenge it. Stuart. It is notable, for example, that a number of members of the House of Lords have business interests linked to Russia or work directly for major Russian companies linked to the Russian state. These relationships should be carefully scrutinized uh, given the potential for the Russian state to exploit them. There must be complete transparency about any links with Russian businesses at every level of politics. And we do not have that in respect of the House of Lords at present. Now, that is all I'm going to say about what's in the published report. There is, of course, a classified annex, but we cannot reveal details in that report without revealing information which could be harmful to the UK. On the other side of the coin, in addition to Putin-linked elites, 
The UK is also home to a number of Putin's critics who have sought sanctuary here, fearing politically motivated charges and harassment. Now, the events of the 4th of March 2018 showed the vulnerability of former Russian intelligence officers who have settled in the UK, and this is one of the issues we do address in the classified annex to the report. What we can say is that it's been clear for some time that Russia under Putin is an established threat, fundamentally unwilling to adhere to international law. The murder of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006 and annexation of Crimea in 2014 are stark indicators of this. But in our opinion, the UK government took its eye off the ball because of its focus on counter-terrorism. The government had badly underestimated the response required to the Russian threat and is still playing catch-up. Russia poses a tough intelligence challenge and the agencies here must have the tools they need to tackle it. The Official Secrets Act, for example, is simply not fit for purpose when it comes to tackling foreign spies. And until we change that, the intelligence community's hands are tied. And just one final point, and that is the need for international consensus against Russian uh, action. Um, to constrain their nefarious activities will rely on making the price to Russia uh, that they extract sufficiently high uh, that they will change, hopefully, their actions. The West is strong when it acts collectively uh, together and the UK needs to take a leading role in that. The expulsion of 153 diplomats from 29 countries and NATO following the US chemical weapons on attack in Salisbury was unprecedented. Together with the subsequent exposure of GRU agents responsible, this sent a clear and strong message that actions would not be tolerated. We must build uh, on that momentum uh, and that momentum must not be lost. So we're now ready to take some questions, and I have a uh, list so far of 10 people, and the first will be Laura Koonsberg from the BBC. Um, thanks very much. drop the ball in terms of looking for political interference. And who do you hold responsible for the failure to look for evidence of what was really going on? Um. Laura, I, I wouldn't want to say that the UK government deliberately avoided asking the questions. But nevertheless, they did avoid asking the questions. And the real criticism is that after the Scottish referendum in 2014, after the DNC hack and leak episode in 2016, it must have been clear that had they looked for similar evidence in the UK, as the report said, it would have been extraordinary if they hadn't reached the same conclusions. So I'm not going to say this was a deliberate act of omission, but an act of omission it was nevertheless, and it's left the UK vulnerable because we do not yet know the scale and scope of the interference. Can I just add to that? Is the security and defence, I think, of uh, not only our democracy but our people should be the first... Uh, role of government. The government here have clearly let us down because, as Stuart has outlined, uh, it wasn't that this was some type of just wild fishing expedition you'd be going on. There was clear evidence, uh, not only just from the Scottish uh, referendum, but also the uh, uh, Democratic uh, leak in the United States. And so serious question need to be asked, why uh, ministers didn't uh, then see that uh, they should at least look uh, at the level of Russian interference in those elections. 
it's remarkable to me that suddenly last Thursday we had a uh, statement saying uh, or, or claiming that uh, Russia in, had uh, interfered in the 2019 uh, general election, uh, but complete silence uh, on what went on before. Guidance of journalists, because of the numbers and the anticipated time of finishing, I'm allowing about four minutes per journalist back and forth. So, Laura, would you like to come back again? Can't hear you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, in taking the evidence on subject, were reasons given to you by any of your witnesses as to why these investigations have not taken place? The, 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 um, the reasons appear to be a complete lack of clarity as to who should instruct it or whether it should be self-tasked. And as we describe in the report, a complete hot potato. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for this. Now, as Kevin Jones pointed out earlier, there's understandable nervousness about intelligence agencies being engaged in the democratic process. But as the report makes clear, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be protecting the democratic process. So what we're saying now is there needs to be clarity from government that this assessment needs to be undertaken whether that's tasked directly by government or whether one of the agencies, MI5, self-tasks to do this work. The, the written evidence, because Ways of Committee look at evidence, um, the evidence which the government provided uh, said they had not seen any successful interference in the UK democratic process or any activities uh, that has led to impact on elections, for example, influence results. However, the scandal is, is the reason for that is because no one had actually sought uh, that and there was no investigation. So they can make that statement uh, without any, uh, but, but no attempt was made to look at it. Uh, so it's a pretty hollow statement. Squeeze one more in if you've got it. Laura? Would you like to ask one more question? Can't hear you. <laughs> obviously, uh, uh, obviously, spooks are causing problems here. <laughs> ah, there we go. There we go. Um, finally, thank, thank you. Um, there's a problem with the mute button. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just, Commissioner Jones, can I just ask you to clarify, Brian, you've accused the Prime Minister of misleading people around the process of the publication of this report. Um, are you saying light about why it should be published? I have to ask the Prime Minister that. All I was setting out was the various statements that had been made, not possibly by the Prime Minister, but by Number 10, uh, which were categorically not true. Um, and, you know, they are facts. Uh, and it's, you know, I know there's a new thing that if Number 10 says something, it's got to be true. Unfortunately, on this occasion, it clearly wasn't. On, uh, I think I listed at least four occasions, which all four, four uh, uh, statements made by Number 10 can be refuted. Thank you very much, Laura. So the next person on my list is uh, Deborah Haynes. Deborah. Uh, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, you're perfectly. Thank you very much. Um, you've obviously sort of set out this, this failure to, this, this lack of curiosity in the, the threat to our democratic processes. Um, while obviously ministers have questions to answer about that, do you also think that the spy chief the, the spy masters who are in charge of the agency should have been more forceful in gripping what you describe as a hot potato and getting to the bottom of whether or not there was actually Russian interference in the Brexit referendum. Primarily, this is a political question. Um, should the government have instructed this work to be undertaken? And the answer is yes, of course it should have. Uh, as to the question about heads of agencies. Only MI5 can self-task and direct work itself. The other agencies would require to be asked to do it. Uh, so yes, uh, MI5 perhaps should have done this work, but more importantly, and I think you led it off very uh, cleverly, the lack of curiosity, particularly after the DNC hack and leak episode, one would have assumed someone at the heart of government might have wanted to know if the efficacy 
of democratic processes in the UK was being undermined, if uh, discordant messages were being amplified, if there was an attempt to actually change the result. That work has not been done. I think there's, a, there's quite rightly, I think, in our democracy, a uh, reluctance for the security service to directly get involved in the political process. I think that's a given. Uh, but I think what is uh, not excusable here, as Stuart has just outlined, that no one in government, in terms of ministerial uh, level or above, actually looked at uh, the uh, you know, flashing lights that were there already in terms of the Scottish uh, referendum and the... Uh, issue in terms of the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, and that is a political question, um, you know, and that is one that needs, should have been looked at. Um, and in terms of failures, that is a major failure because uh, we say in the report, would, if we discovered, for example, uh, interference, could we have quantified its effect on elections? No, we couldn't. I don't think you could. But at least I think we could have actually known what the threat was, but also uh, measures in the future we could take to mitigate against those threats. Deborah, have another go. Thank you. Um, obviously, you can't say categorically whether or not there was Russian interference in the Brexit referendum, but given all the evidence that you have heard, what is your best guess? Do you believe that Russia did try to influence that vote? And uh, just a second follow-up, if I may. Um, you talked about how that standard government line that we've heard so many times that there's been no evidence of successful interference. Do you believe that that was the government being deliberately evasive to avoid the fact that they, don't, they just simply don't know because they haven't looked? Well, I'm not sure if it was being evasive or if it was trying to just be a little too cute. Um, and as Kevin said, it would be impossible to quantify the impact of interference. So in the sense that it's impossible to prove whether that interference had been successful or otherwise. The key point, though, and you allude to it in your question, they had not sought even to ask that question, and that's at the heart of this report. Deborah, I think the, the question is this, is, and I think there's obviously a misunderstanding of the role of this committee, we deal with evidence. Uh, we have extensive powers, including access to some of the most highly uh, classified and secret material uh, that is available to uh, government. Uh, there was no evidence uh, that we saw, and the reason why there was no evidence, because no one had actually asked for the work to be done. So in terms of saying, did Russia interfere in the EU referendum, uh, you can't say that. Uh, but no one in government asked uh, that either. Uh, so on the evidence we saw, I think uh, uh, we could come to the conclusion that uh, we can't make a judgment call, and Stuart's right, even if uh, there had been an investigation into it, quantifying the effect of that actually on, on the result would be, would be very difficult. But we saw no evidence because there was no evidence and government, no one in government sought to look or ask the questions uh, that uh, needed to be asked. One more, Deborah. Well, I mean, given that that's your finding, are you now going to, well, are you demanding that they do go and look yes. and find out? And will you, as a committee, in be following up this inquiry? And Well, we cannot ask the agencies to do work. We can only ask them to tell us what they already know. <clears throat> but it's self-evident from the publication of this report that the government should now sit up and pay attention, and we have welcomed, as I said, uh, the work that they appear to have done in relation to 2019, but we've yet to see the evidence uh, of that. Uh, what we've also said is that the committee will now look at any evidence which comes forward uh, in relation to what's happened 2019 and beyond. But in, I would also, we would also agree, and it's in the report, with the DCMS Select Committee, which has made a similar request to government in the past that it should try to understand the scale and nature of the interference in previous electoral and democratic events. 
what, what I would say is this, is we had, we had a written ministerial statement last week suggesting that, uh, from, a, from the Foreign Secretary, suggesting that uh, Russia had interfered in the 2019 uh, general election. We have seen no evidence of that be, because we've not been provided with uh, any of the intelligence which supports that uh, statement. We've asked uh, to see it. Uh, but the important point here, I think, is that in terms of the protecting a democratic process, uh, lessons should have been learned, or, or, or at least the question should have been asked, and they weren't. Uh, so if, uh, and the report is very clear, we suggest government should now do it, but as Stuart said, we can't task uh, the agencies or anyone else to uh, undertake this review. Thank you, Kevin. We now come to Andy Bell of Five News. That's the question which we want to have answered. Now, the UK government in their written ministerial statement last week uh, pointed, I think they say in their statement, there was an extensive assessment uh, and there was the leaking of what's described as illicitly acquired material in relation to the UK-US trade deals. It was posted, I understand, on Reddit. The UK government say it didn't gain traction but it was clearly being put out there, according to the UK government, in order to interfere directly in a UK election. Now, I'm not going to say that's the worst that's happened, because, and this is the whole point, Andy, and it's alluded to in your question directly, we don't know, because no assessment of previous electoral events was undertaken or requested and that's absolutely shocking, given what we do know about Russian interference, particularly the hack and leak operation at the Democratic National Committee in the United States. Andy, I think a lot of it uh, is, I think, being on open source, some of the uh, things you're suggesting about. But what is actually, <laughs> it did shock me, that the government have not actually looked at this uh, this area. And as Stuart just said, there was evidence from the po It wasn't during the uh, Scottish referendum, it was the post uh, result. There's clear evidence in the United States. The United States took it serious enough to actually investigate it. There was hack and leaks in terms of the French uh, elections as well. So there was a lot of evidence that Russia were doing this to uh, some of our closest allies, but government has saw, thought that it wasn't necessary to uh, look uh, in terms of how it affected uh, those elections. And Stuart has highlighted the issue of the statement last week. Now, some cynics might say it was convenient to perhaps draw the thorns from this report. Uh, but if you look at the statement, uh, I don't think it says that Russia actually did the original leaking of the what it said, it would, it would amplify it. But we can't comment on that from an intelligence point of view because we have not seen the intelligence that underlies that we've asked for it. Um, and uh, so until we've actually seen the intelligence that underlies that statement, uh, we're, as, we're just uh, you know, uh, taking the statement uh, as it's been produced. Further question, Andy? Yes, uh, because this is the first time I can imagine for a very long time that these sorts of matters are being discussed widely in the media and in the public. I mean, today and last week we've had two written ministerial statements on this sort of subject with the publication of this report today. I think there's an understanding now of the way state and non-state operators behave trying to influence people's opinion and the results of elections, 
bots and trolls all over the place, I think this will now become part of the firmament of political discussion and media discussion, how we stamp it out, how we stop the disinformation, how we protect the democratic process processes from malign state involvement or engagement or interference. So uh, yes, I do hope this is a start of a watershed in making sure everything we do is clean or as clean as it can be from outside interference. Um, Andy, we have time for a quick last one if you have a third question. No, you're okay, right. Let's move on. Luke Harding of The Guardian. All I can say uh, is that uh, the only reference to it is, I think, on page 50. Uh, sorry, is, is, is footnote 50 on page 13 in the report. Do you want to have a, uh, a follow-up, Luke? Sorry about that, uh, Luke. Uh, it is referred to in the report, but it's uh, referred to, on, if you look on page 13, uh, footnote 50 uh, covers uh, Mr. Aaron Banks. Um. Uh, okay, okay, if I, if I um, uh, follow, follow, follow up, just, just to be clear, are, are you now saying that Downing Street and the security agencies should launch a comprehensive investigation into, into Russian interference around the 2016 referendum. Is that one of your messages today? Uh, yes, self-evidently. Uh, we need to understand, the UK government needs to understand, what interference there may have been, uh, whether it had any impact on influence the result or not, not least to ensure that future political events, future electoral processes, uh, can be protected from similar interference. Hi, sorry, Luke, Luke, Kevin wants to come in. Just hold on. Yeah, the, the clear line is yes, we do, because it's not just about looking historically at what happened or didn't happen, but it's actually making sure that we can have the integrity going forward, knowing the threat, uh, putting in policy place that protect the democratic process. And I think, you know, in a democracy, that is very important in terms of that people have confidence. Uh, that the process is robust as possible uh, and is protected. But if you haven't even looked at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the process in the past, I'm not sure how you can protect in the future. So, uh, yes, we want to the government now to look. But as I said earlier on, we have no powers to instruct government or agencies to do that. Luke, Luke do you want to follow up further? Yeah, yeah just, just last question. Mm -hmm. uh, This is not about party politics. This is about, it's above that. It's actually about making sure that our uh, political process uh, is as secure as possible, that people have faith uh, that their vote counts. Uh, and it is important, and I would say, say this very clearly, is, is that, and I know a lot of accusations being made about the past chair of, uh, uh, and the personalities on the committee that drew up this report, that wasn't the main, that was, that was, that was nothing to do with it at all. It was to do to actually ensure that we actually looked uh, at Russian interference in the political system. And, you know, if we are going to have integrity of the system going forward, we need to, one, see if there's a threat, but also, more importantly, learn lessons and see if there are things we need to change, for example, uh, to, to ensure that uh, that electoral system is, uh, is secure. Because dem democracy then day is very precious. Thank you, Kevin. So we'll now move on to Sam Lister of The Express. Uh, 
It, it certainly is not the latter. The uh, intelligence agencies most certainly have the ability to get a grip of this. They need to be tasked or choose to task themselves to do it. As to why the government won't touch this, perhaps that's a question you might want to ask them because one would have imagined whichever party or parties were in government at any given time, the one thing they would want to ensure was the robustness and security and efficacy and trust in the electoral process. So it is beyond this committee to understand why there has been such an omission and that information on potential interference was never requested. As to why they wouldn't want to do it in the future, well, let's hope those opinions or minds have changed and they'll now take this matter more seriously. Follow up? <coughs> I just wanted to touch on an issue Mr. Hoey raised earlier about the House of Lords and also some transparency there. Um, this morning, Bill Brown, who uh, gave evidence to this investigation, said that he handed over names and evidence about Conservative and Labour peers who take money from oligarchs to do their bidding. Do you think there is any uh, evidence of criminal? Um, matters in relation to that, and should there be an investigation into uh, the activities in the Lords and kind of overhaul? Well, d d there's two things. I won't comment on the specific allegation, and I don't know what information was handed over to whom. Obviously, if it's uh, alleged criminality, that's a matter for the police. But what we're saying is that in the House of Commons, for example, uh, every earning over £100 has to be declared. That does not exist in the House of Lords. Even that little thing, that absence of obvious transparency, needs to be addressed, and we believe, because of the potential for people or for the Russian state to try to use people, the more transparency we can have and the quicker we can have it, the better. So at the most basic level, let's have those who are employed by directly or do work for indirectly, oligarchs or companies linked to the Russian state are at the very least declare, declaring their income from that in the same way that members of parliament have to do. That strikes me as a sensible, modern, transparent, common sense thing to do. And there's no reason why that cannot be done quickly. I agree with what Stuart's just said. In terms of the names you're suggesting, I'm not aware of who they are. Uh, did we choose to name people in this uh, report produced today? No, we did not. Um, and, you know, the uh, redactions were agreed uh, w with the entire committee and also the uh, uh, security services as well. Names were mentioned at the committee, and uh, I don't think I wish to comment on those that were, are not in the open report. Um, one more follow-up, please. Um, well, just, just do you think any, anybody has questionable And just more generally, um, if you, you talk about how the government must play, uh, is playing catch up now and must take action, what are the top three priorities you feel like the government must now um, look at to rectify this issue? Uh, well, it, it, there are many things they could do. Uh, but let's, if you want three, let's start with uh, investigate thoroughly uh, whether there has been interference historically. Let's do the transparency uh, on the House of Lords. Uh, and of course, there's so much more in this report than the rather narrow scope we've spoken about so far. There's a revamp needed of the Official Secrets Act. It is not illegal to be a foreign agent in the UK today. It's not illegal to spy. It's only illegal once you pass information over. Uh, that surely can't be right. So there's three off the top of my head. There are many more. Individuals need to take responsibility for their own <coughs> actions in terms of how they operate, but uh, I'm not going to comment on names uh, in terms of uh, that you referred to. Uh, there is an access report which we will not comment on because uh, of uh, the nature of the material in that for national security reasons. In terms of if there is criminality, that, as Stuart said, is a uh, matter for the police. Uh, but the best 
issue here is transparency, so we know what uh, people's connections are, what they're doing, uh, and I think that uh, would be important for those individuals on the list you refer to, I think it's for them to comment on, on uh, why, uh, what their actions are, not this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. We may now move to Larissa Brown. The reason for the delay is, is the government uh, delayed this report. I don't think, and I think they've spent the last uh, certain week trying to discredit it by saying that there's nothing in it or it's out of date. And I think if you read it, it clearly isn't. It's very, clearly very relevant. Um, and I think that is important. The, the motivations for that uh, are obviously uh, for government and the, the Prime Minister to answer it. But what I want to just reiterate this point is, and I did lay out the four points when I opened uh, this press conference, uh, the reasons put up by the government for the delay are just not true. Uh, so they need to answer that, uh, and uh, I think you know, I'll leave that there. In terms of cyber, uh, I think it's well documented open source. Yeah, yeah, the effect of the delay, it was, what do you think the impact of the delay? Well, I, I think I think as the previous chairman I think said earlier this week is is that uh, this should have been produced before the uh, 2019 general election. It's then for the public to uh, you know make a judgment on that. It was delayed uh, because of government, not because of this committee. Uh, and you know what I think I think has saddened me a little bit in the last couple of weeks and certainly uh, the last 24 hours is a way of trying to diminish the impact of this report. We do a serious job for this, uh, this country in terms of oversight of our security. That's an important point of our, uh, part of our democracy. And I think the way in which the government have tried to politicize this, but also, I think, uh, tried to, you know, to more or less push this uh, uh, report aside, doesn't help uh, in terms of the important role that uh, this committee and parliament has in terms of scrutinizing uh, you know, in, in, in scrutinising our, our democracy. Because if we are going to have faith uh, in our security services, and, you know, we have brave men and women who work for us, uh, and the public have trust in them, uh, parliamentary oversight is very important. I'll let Stuart do the side warning. <coughs> um, Larissa, I think there's um, two answers to your question. The impact is that any lessons which could have been learned will now be learned rather later than they ought to have been, perhaps too late to stop some other cyber attacks. But the other thing we need to learn from it is that what we have, and I said this in the opening remarks, is a ridiculously complex wiring diagram of responsibilities in relation to cyber alone. It's in the report, it's in paragraph uh, 18. Uh, but just as an example, the Foreign Secretary has responsibility for the National Cyber Security Centre. The Defence Secretary has overall responsibility for offensive cyber and for the National Offensive Cyber Programme. The Secretary of State at DCMS leads on digital matters. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster is responsible for the National Cyber Security Strategy. That's different to the National Centre for Cyber Security. This is ridiculous. So we probably should have learned a little sooner that this complex wiring diagram isn't fit for purpose either. So there are a number of lessons that went unlearned early enough. Would you like one more question, Larissa? Hello, fine, thank you. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll move to Paul War of the Huffington Post. Paul. Thank you. 
Well, there's a, there's a genuine uh, nervousness in the security services about getting involved in the democratic process, and I, you know, I, I think we all appreciate the reasons for that. Uh, but no, ultimately, this was a government decision, a ministerial decision, and you know, short of uh, you know uh, getting a, a, a big flashing light outside number ten, this was going on. Um, they, they could have missed this. Um, and it wasn't taken. So I think to sidestep and say blame the agencies is is, is not fair because um, you know I wouldn't want to to live in a society where uh, our security services are politically directed. That's you know, going down a road which I don't think uh, uh, is very healthy for democracy and also very healthy for a society I certainly want to live in. Um, so no, they, the government have got to take responsibility for this. They can't sidestep it and blame other people. Uh, a decision was taken not to. The evidence was there uh, from, from those, and that's uh, the quote you've just given in the report uh, uh, is the conclusion we've come to. Stuart. Paul, the, the quote you read out, that if they'd done the same investigation, they'd have reached the same conclusions, that's really damning of the government. Subsequent failure not to undertake that investigation or assessment. You know, it's not that they didn't know by then what was going on in other parts of the world. And we still are left flummoxed as to understand why no one, as one of your colleagues asked earlier, lacked the curiosity to say, are we fully protected here? What's going on? And what more needs to be done? to beef up particularly the cyber defences. Paul, come back. Yeah, can I, can I check more precisely who you think is to, to blame or is responsible within the government? You keep saying, obviously, the UK government has some serious failures here. Are you talking about both the Cameron government in its diabetes days? Are you talking about the May government? And in particular, Foreign Secretary under Theresa May, Boris Johnson, for failing to grip this. Who are you talking about... <laughs> well, you'll be aware that UK governments now have a penchant for talking about the whole-of-government approach, uh, a joined-up approach. Whether it's joined up or not is a matter for another time. But they talk about a whole-of-government approach. When it comes to national security, when it comes to cyber security, as I've just laid out, covering multiple departments, this should have been a cabinet decision. In one sense, whether it was Cameron or May or Johnston at the helm, is almost irrelevant. The action required to be taken to assess and identify the threat and put in place the defences should have been undertaken by government with a decision made at a cabinet level and that appears to us simply not to have happened. So, sorry, Paul. Can, can, can I, Paul, Paul, uh, can Kevin I, is coming in. Sorry, Paul. Can, can I just say... Yeah. Uh, I concur with what Stuart said. Ultimately, uh, the Prime Minister of the day, uh, you know, is responsible for how he or, uh, his or her government is conducted. Uh, and in terms of that decision and oversight, some, the responsibility has got ultimately lie with them. If you want the, uh, you know, the Harry Truman, the book has to stop somewhere. Paul? Sorry, I, I, I said quite the reverse. I, I was saying there was no active running. I, I thought I said there was no active running away from this, but nevertheless, no action was taken and it wasn't investigated. Thank you. I, I, just, want, I just want to clarify um, the, the hot potato remark was about this issue that the press release makes very clear, which is about 
which of the agencies should take the lead in protecting our systems from threats of this sort. So it's that, that's really where we make a, a firm recommendation. Uh, and in a way, it's commendable that uh, the intelligence services are reluctant to get in too close to the party political process and the electoral process, but somebody has to protect them and somebody has to take lead responsibility and the report clearly makes recommendations. Just want to get that on the record. So we now come to Ben Glaze of the Mirror. Ben, you just need to read the open source material. You know, they are forming this area. And uh, as I, it, the report says, it takes a number of different uh, approaches, whether it be uh, the influence event in terms of uh, fake news that uh, has been highlighted as I the report, but also amplifying, and, and that's aimed really at amplifying already existing divisions within electoral systems. Uh, what is it to be gained from it? Well, I think it's to disorientate uh, what it sees as one of its uh, uh, adversaries. And uh, there's obviously, in terms of the hack and leak uh, uh, of the both in the United States and France, uh, was a was a way of doing that. Uh, in terms of uh, influence, um, yeah, the the ultimate thing is to is to is is to weaken us in terms of uh, the, and you know, we are vulnerable in one respect because in an open democracy like uh, our own, we are open and free in terms of difference of opinions. Uh, they clearly seek to uh, you know amplify those divisions. To, to the, the main one is taking uh, you know misinformation down as quickly uh, as possible, and this has, I think, already been pursued by DCMS. But it needs to be timely and taken down. The other, I think, role which is mentioned in the report, which government can play, is when there is clear evidence uh, of any uh, state actor, uh, you know, using social media in this way. Uh, we should name them and shame them. Uh, but also, I think the recommendation is that is the same around social media, where if they refuse to take what are clearly uh, designed to uh, interfere in our system, they should be named and shamed as well. Very good. Um, would you like a, a third to go, Ben? Very good. We'll move, we'll move on then to Alex Hudson of Newsweek, please. If you look at what the government said in the written ministerial statement last week, they said after an analysis the government has concluded it's almost certain Russian actors sought to interfere in the 2019 general election through the online amplification of illicitly acquired and leaked government documents. 
And it goes on in that vein. So this committee will undertake to, or the new committee will undertake to seek further inquiries into this to actually see the evidence, the intelligence that would stand this up. At which point we'll be able to answer the question much more clearly. Was the interference widespread? Did it simply take a few dodgy documents and amplify them? Did it seek or achieve in changing how people voted, although that's unlikely, only after we begin to see some of the intelligence behind the government statement and other information, we'll be able to answer fully the question about the scale and scope of the interference that you're asking. Thanks, Alex. We as a committee have access to, uh, and re access to request, uh, the classified information behind this WMS, and we've done that, we've asked for that. But we're a bit limited in the sense that at this time, uh, we, we can't really say a great deal more than is in the public domain because we've not actually not seen any of the classified material which the government used to come to uh, this conclusion. Likewise, uh, we've not also seen any classified information about any wider involvement uh, or alleged involvement in the 2019 uh, general election. Uh, as Stuart's just said, once we see that classified information, uh, then we could make a, a judgment uh, on that WMS. But as I said, I think earlier on, it did come as a little surprise uh, to a number of the members of the committee that this WMS came out uh, the week before this uh, Russia report was being. Uh, thing. But we will assess it once we get the uh, uh, intelligence and uh, uh, make a view. But we can't really say uh, anything more because we haven't seen it. Are you, are you more hopeful um, that the evidence will be much better this time compared to the previous time the evidence we can have looked <laughs> well, well, if they look for someone provided to us, we'll be delighted. Because the whole point and the whole theme of this is they did not seek evidence on interference in previous political or democratic events. Therein lies the fundamental problem. So self-evidently, if they've sought evidence and provided this time, that will be 100% better than the very limited or non-existent effort that was put in historically. Yeah, I mean, can I, can I just say is, is that uh, you know, if we have had a change in government, that somehow they're now looking uh, for evidence for interfering elections, that's a good uh, move. Uh, but again, we haven't seen the intelligence around, around this particular WMS. Uh, and the more important thing, it's not just this thing that was put in, the reasons why it was put in the public domain last week, as I say, uh, <coughs> I'm a bit sceptical of. Um, but w w is there a wider investigation into other, uh, uh, other things? Uh, we as a committee have not been informed of that uh, prior to. And as I say, the first we heard of this uh, last week was when we received the WMS on uh, Thursday morning. Uh, would you like to come back further? Yes, if I may. Yeah. Um, given Mike Pompeo's in the UK today, and he's very keenly focused on China, and um, met with China all this morning, we believe, do you think that this Russian, the work on Russia is actually falling down a priority list for government, particularly in diplomatic relationships um, overseas, particularly with the US, because of recent political focus on China and Hong Kong? Uh, and how, how are you hoping that this report will bring it back to the, the top of the agenda? Well, the fact that we've got journalist after journalist speaking about it today, that this uh, report has been much awaited, uh, and I don't think lets people down, this is not out of date. I think this brings Russia back up the political and diplomatic agenda, as it should do. And that's not to take the, any focus off of China at all, of course. But sometimes governments need to think about more than one thing simultaneously, particularly when it comes to important foreign affairs matters. Yeah, Alex, I mean, China, China's uh, got a lot of uh, attention in the last uh, few uh, months, uh, certainly within Parliament. Um, one could ask why uh, similar questions aren't being asked uh, around uh, Russia's uh, uh, involvement. And I think the point I would make is that 
Uh, I think the Russian ambassador said the weekend that uh, he wants good relationships with uh, the UK. I personally would agree with that. I think most people would agree with that. But that can only be achieved if Russia uh, applies, you know, uh, and works by the international rules-based order which we all accept. Um, and I think without that, uh, Russia continues to be uh, a threat to uh, uh, the, the, UK, the UK. And this, uh, this is why it's remarkable that, uh, you know, the government uh, haven't looked uh, at what uh, in involvement they've had in terms of previous elections, apart from, uh, say, the late WMS last week uh, on the 2019 general election. Thank you very much, Alex. And before you leave us, I'd just like to point out for the record that I'm sure with regard to the issuing of the written ministerial statement, the government would undoubtedly say that they briefed the new committee at the first opportunity, so soon after it had been formed. The trouble is, of course, the committee should have been formed a lot earlier. So our final questioner is Torquil Christen from the Daily Record. Torquil. Um, firstly, the report, and this is on page 13, talks about the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, so that's there, and there is a very clear footnote on that page, which I'll read for clarity, Torkel. It says, it was widely reported shortly after the referendum that Russian election observers had suggested there were irregularities in the conduct of the vote and that this position was being widely pushed by Russian state media. We understand the UK government viewed this as primarily aimed at discrediting the UK in the eyes of a domestic Russian audience. But nevertheless, those messages post-referendum were being put out there to discredit the results. So you're absolutely right. That was a warning light. There were subsequent ones, the 2016 DNC, Hack and leak, the en marche in France. And it wasn't the case that the government weren't told they should be looking at this. On page 14, again, this is in a footnote, but I'm sure you'll avidly read it over the next few days, the DCMS Select Committee called on the government to launch an independent investigation into foreign influence, disinformation funding, voter manipulation, and the sharing of data in relation to the Scottish independence referendum. So the government were told by a select committee of the House, not us, but another select committee, to undertake precisely the work that would have identified the scale and scope of this threat. Sorry, can, 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 sorry. Can, can, so we've got Kevin yet. Yeah. yeah just, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, will you stop, please? I'm sorry, will you stop? We've got Kevin to reply first. Okay, I'll call you in, don't worry. Yeah. No, as, as Stuart said, all the evidence was there uh, from the Scottish uh, referendum. Um, you know, short of you know, having a, a large van outside Downing Street uh, with a billboard on it saying this is what was going on, what more did the government need? Uh, and it does raise the question is, you know, why the decision was taken not to, to look uh, at the uh, referendum. And, you know, I think the report quite rightly draws comparison to what happened in the United States, where, you know, investigations did take place uh, into the uh, uh, leaking. <coughs> uh, and, uh, you, know, so, you know, here that decision wasn't taken. Right. Here you go. Come. It's so, okay, carry on. Uh, I was in this what Stuart said because the report says that there are people who played a role wittingly or unwittingly 
and formed a former Western national de facto agents of the Russian state. Now, okay. do you include Edinburgh based Sputnik press agents in this Russia today? And particularly, uh, you call for colleague of yours, Alex Salmon. Is he a de facto agent of the Russian state? The um, reference to de facto agents and the buffer was in relation to enablers, accountants, lawyers, estate agents, people who do company formation, wittingly or unwittingly, for people close to the Russian state. We make an explicit criticism of, uh, we actually say that there was in the run-up to the EU referendum a preponderance of anti-EU pro-Brexit pieces on RT and Sputnik. What the report does not do is make any criticism of any individual program maker or commentator or presenter. That's not what this is about. It's about RT and Sputnik as institutions who are able very quickly, very quickly when they need to, to get out the Russian state version of events. It's not a criticism of any particular individual at all. And I don't think it can be much clearer than that, Torko. Right, Torko. One more go if you want it. Can't hear you. Sorry about that. Carry on. In general, your report talks about this being the new normal, Russian interference in Western democracy. So just a few words for how would you summarize the threat of Russia to, to Western democracy? Is it just a nuisance we're going to have to live with? I think we describe it as a new normal. It, it, it's, it, is, it is part of their, uh, their strategy. And I think what we need to do is uh, you know, make sure uh, that we've got policies in place which protects our democratic process. And you know, I think uniquely in the UK, because of a paper-based voting system, it makes it harder to actually attack that side of it. Uh, but, you know, one of the great strengths would have been actually doing the investigation, because if, if the government had done that, at least then it could have looked for vulnerabilities, looked for uh, things, and been able to change them. It chose not to do that. Thank you, uh, thank you Torquil. Uh, we have a late addition to our list, and uh, it's the final one, I believe, Paul Brand or from ITV. No, I, 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 that's a very political question which I don't think we can answer. All we can say and all the report says is that they didn't seek the information. That's the real shock in this. You know, the, the kind of political subterfuge that might be dreadfully interesting in you know, the tea rooms of the House of Commons is irrelevant. The fact is they did not seek to understand impact or scale or scope of the interference in previous political events, including the EU referendum. They should now do that so that we can understand what it entailed, what impact it may or may not have had, what influence it may or may not have had, and to work out how to protect the efficacy of the democratic process going forward. It's not for this committee. This committee. It's not for this committee to make a political judgment on that. It's for others if they want to draw their own conclusions. Entirely up to them. But what we were tasked with, with as I, as I keep saying, you know, unique access to, uh, uh, you know, material which is not in the public domain. Uh, we were able to look at what uh, was, or in this case, was not done. And I think the really serious issue uh, that this report puts forward is that, as I said earlier on, democracy is, very, is a very precious thing, which I think the report refers to. Uh, we need to do what we can to protect it, and the government has not done that. Uh, and that's why, you know, we suggest in the matter of urgency it is looked at, because we're not dealing here with uh, an adversary who is going to go away soon. 
uh, why ministers chose not to do that and actually learn the lessons and possibly, if necessary, change things, uh, that's one you've got to address to them. Would you like to come back? Sorry. Would you like to come back? back? Right. Thank you. Before, thank you very much. Before I uh, make my concluding point, uh, I'd just like to ask if either of my colleagues have got any questions that they wish they had been asked and weren't. No. 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 Can I just raise one, Julian? It's, it's actually uh, on page 33 of the uh, report, and it's actually about legislation which is going forward. We've concentrated a lot on, on elections, but uh, uh, it's the issue around a new Espionage Act um, in the. Director of MI5 did give evidence to us that uh, uh, when he said that uh, there were issues in the current legislature, the uh, Official Secrets Act, which were no longer really relevant and should actually be changed, the Law Commission did uh, report in 2017 uh, on the of the new Espionage Act, and I think as a matter of priority that should uh, be brought forward. The other one, which refers to the section in terms of uh, um, the use of individuals here, uh, financial or otherwise, to promote uh, a foreign power, is a recommendation that, similar to the US as a Foreign Agents Registration Act, that should also be a priority for government, uh, so that anyone acting on behalf of a uh, foreign uh, government will have to register uh, before doing so again coming to the point that Stuart made earlier on about having maximum transparency uh, in uh, those that operate uh, within our democracy. So in closing, I would like to thank all the media who've taken part in this event. I'd like to thank the committee staff who've worked tremendously hard and uh, also the broadcasting technicians who've made it possible. Uh, this uh, committee has been subjected to unprecedented uh, delay and dislocation. This really must never happen again. The sooner normal relations are restored between this committee and the government, the better it will be for all concerned. Yet that prospect has not been helped by the government refusing to tell us what was in the written ministerial statement about this Russia report, which the government chose to table in the Commons at 10.30 this morning to clash with the start of this event. Now, maybe I'm being unfair to them. Maybe they've got another plan. Maybe they're going to add to their written ministerial statement by making an oral statement on the subject in the Commons tomorrow so that the Commons can have its say and ask its questions. That would be a very positive sign. Let's hope it happens. Thank you, and that concludes this event.